This year at the University of Pennsylvania, we've been taking some time out from our normal activities to reflect on our 250 years of history, our history in pursuit of Ben Franklin's vision of a university. We are still Ben Franklin's university in so many ways, a lively, vibrant, great place to be. In four days in May, we came together for an intensive festival of intellectual activity and celebration. 25,000 of our alumni and friends were back on campus to help us celebrate, and it was a marvelous occasion. Two videotapes were made for that occasion, one to introduce the Ted Koppel Colloquia, three discussions of the world of the 21st century, a world without walls. The other was made for the college's 250th celebration. And in that, you will see alumni reflecting on their experiences at Penn and saying something about the Penn that was, the Penn that is, the Penn that is to be. I think you'll enjoy both of them. Oh, look at the tradition at, at Penn, you will discover that Penn is a university of first. It was the first institution in North America to be called a university. The collegiate study of business was invented here. The first electronic digital uh, computer was put together here in, in the 1940s. All sorts of things were done first here. And it is, I think, uh, Franklin's vision and his uh, entrepreneurial nature and the fact that that has been uh, passed on from one generation of Penn scholars and students and alumni to the next. The kind of student who comes to Penn from what I see in my classes and in my interactions is a student who's hardworking, bright, alert, aware of what's going on in the world, eager to learn more about what's going on, eager to challenge, eager, eager to debate, eager to discuss. There's about $220 billion of currency. Uh, our students, and we view our students, so all of them as potential uh, world leaders um, will will rub up against uh, uh, people from different backgrounds, different cultures, and the kind of world that we're moving into. That's of absolutely vital importance. We have the largest number of students from other countries of any of the Ivy League uh, institutions. Uh, we take great pride in that. We have a community which is culturally a diverse. I have always believed, and now more than ever, that we need to, even starting in high school uh, and earlier, make students aware of other countries in the world, languages, uh, cultures, and the like, and we don't do enough of that. If I'm a native Chinese, I'm very concerned about what's going on in China. It's important to have people from other backgrounds who maybe see the same, same things very, very differently. I kind of hope that in the future, you know, um, world relations will improve and different countries and people will learn about other people because I think that's, you know, you get understanding and peace. How do you divide it? Once you choose... Well, in this day and age, money, uh, always it has been the case, but in this day and age more than ever, uh, knowing what we know about the demography of our own country, knowing what we know about communications uh, uh, in the world, uh, the world is, uh, we are one big planet all together, Everything is connected to everything else. The world is changing in such a remarkable way. Science is changing. Our views of literature, our views of what we are, is changing so dramatically. We couldn't possibly, no matter how good we are, anticipate all of that. I mean, it's just like all of a sudden all our texts don't even apply anymore, and I think that's great to see history in the making. With the walls falling in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, with change coming to Africa and South America, and with the economy of the world being knit together in an international market that really knows no national boundaries, it's increasingly important for people to be able to operate in a multicultural, multinational setting. It's been a while, I mean, the whole world has changed before our eyes, and it's hard, personally, having a really hard time accepting it, or making, not accepting it, but making any sense out of what's going on. I just hope that these change have, changes have not come too quickly. If you had asked anyone a year ago today and said that these events would have unfolded, they would have looked at you like you're crazy. I'm, I'm in fact, very positive about this, and it's going to last. And I'm happy about this because everything is going towards one goal, ultimately for the good of human beings. 
We're looking in both directions. We're looking back at where we've been, our history, our tradition, but also we're looking forward to see how our history and our tradition uh, can ready us for the 21st century. I love to spend my evenings strolling my campus. Won't you join me? Welcome, dear friends, to the celebration of the college. Since its beginnings, 250 or so years ago, the college was my best idea. From it evolved the University of Pennsylvania with its schools, arts and sciences, medicine, law, the Wharton School, Engineering, Annenberg School for Communication, Nursing, Graduate Fine Arts, Social Work, Graduate Education, Dental Medicine, and Veterinary Medicine. It all began with an itinerant preacher, George Whitfield. His sermons were so popular that in 1740, his followers erected a building for him to preach in. Today, he'd be on television. We founders were mavericks who envisioned a school for mavericks. We followed our own path, signing the Declaration of Independence and voting at the Continental Congress. Our college had a new curriculum which emphasized the useful as well as the ornamental. Pioneers like Benjamin Rush and David Rittenhouse taught here. The college had the first professor of law, James Wilson. John Morgan and William Shippen started the nation's first school of medicine. We became the first university because we were a place for doers and visionaries for whom anything was possible. And that spirit is alive today, stronger than ever. I was the first one in my family ever to go to college. Penn gave me that opportunity on a scholarship. Without that opportunity, I couldn't have made the kind of contribution that I hope I've made to humanity. And Penn does that for every qualified young person. Of all the places I watch over on campus, this is my favorite. College Hall symbolizes our renaissance. When we moved to West Philadelphia in 1872, it marked a break with the past. Unfortunately, after I left, the university had its ups and downs. It wasn't until Provost's delay that the world caught up with my vision for the model university. Women were officially admitted, although they had to wait to be fully appreciated. Why, as late as the 1930s, they were still waiting. Because back in 1932, Penn was one male-oriented school. And as I said to my classmates at that dinner, sisters, we have overcome. And, but I told all the boys we really loved them and that everything was forgiven. And it all ended up with Hale, Pennsylvania. Under Provost William Pepper, the campus grew. Thirteen new departments were added. Joseph Wharton founded the first business school. The Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and of Education started. The Mask and Wig Club was organized. Edward Mybridge pioneered moving pictures. Penn began admitting foreign and black students. Is this the nation's most beautiful urban campus? A lot of us would say yes. Many thanks go to Provost Charles Harrison. He donated much of the money for the quad. Birthday house was a gift in his honor from his wife. While he was provost, the nation's first student union Houston Hall was built. The campus expanded. Many of the buildings were designed by members of our School of Fine Arts, which has given the world so much beauty. 
course, it took time to get the campus to look this nice. When I came in 1953, this was basically a commuter campus. Uh, Woodland Avenue and Locust Street went right through the campus. Uh, there were a bunch of sort of not too attractive buildings right along Woodland Avenue. Um, and uh, it was really just at the beginning of the conversion of this school from a basically commuter school to a residential school. After Harrison, other leaders oversaw even more growth. Penn became one of the nation's and the world's best institutions. The changes became more and more rapid. The Annenberg School for Communication and the Annenberg Center were established. The vet school had a new home. The library outgrew Furness and moved to Van Pelt. One of the most exciting projects was ENIAC, the forerunner of today's computers. Are people becoming obsolete? The giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes like your radio and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now it's solving math. What brought dynamic students here was the faculty. We've always had great teachers, even when they had their little quirks. Our first provost, William Smith, with whom I didn't always see eye to eye, taught moral philosophy. Uh, when he was imprisoned in a political dispute, he continued to teach his class from his cell. Med school professor Ed Piper's hobby was racing trains. He hooked up a catheter, one of my inventions, so that he could drive cross-country without stopping. We've had Nobel Prize winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, winners of all sorts of prizes. And most of all, we've had professors who make a difference in the lives of their students. His name was Otto Harbison, and he taught Shakespeare in College Hall. And he was the act uh, goodbye, Mr. Chips, professor. I had, he, he was stimulating, he, he, was, he was a whole show. He had incredible charm and dignity and, and, and passion for Shakespeare. And, uh, and I was infected with that. And, and I'll never forget his lectures. Um, he was worth the price of four years admission. Zigzag, look upon my face to another time, another place. I also remember Rezanovsky's uh, Russian history course. His introductory, his, uh, his opening lecture every semester was exactly the same. He had this tattered pile of notes. But it was, uh, I used to bring, bring uh, friends there, friends from, from out of the university, just to see this performance. No matter what you pursued on campus or in life, the liberal arts enhanced your experience. I went through a period where I was going to major in economics, I was going to major in architecture, I was going to major in English, and ended up majoring in history. In the process of being so indecisive, uh, I got a very broad education. Uh, and that has given me a vocabulary and a curiosity about a lot of different things in life. The other thing that brings students here is our convivial social life. We've had great traditions. The bowl fight, smock fight, the Beaux-Arts ball, heyday. Traditions come and go with the generations, but students always have fun here. Oh, I have a lot of special memories. Uh, I guess the one that comes to mind first uh, was the first football game that uh, I went in Franklin Field where, like all the freshmen, we marched in with our freshman dinks on, and I happened to be sitting in the back row of the freshman section in those days they would say, you know, send up the freshmen, and so a group grabbed me. Before I knew what happened, were passing me up over their heads to the top. So it was probably the first thing that I passed at the university, was going over the student body. As I think about it, the memories of my undergraduate years in Penn, I probably look back most affectionately uh, to a, a tradition we had, I don't know if it's still around today, called Skimmer Day where everyone dra dressed in uh, straw hat skimmers and went down to, uh, to the Schuylkill River to see the races. It was a great time, a great experience, and it sort of coalesced everything uh, about, about the school. It was a great experience for us all.
even in the turbulent 1960s, students enjoyed themselves. And we were quite an iconoclastic group for those days. We came out attacking everybody from the cheerleaders to the fraternity system. And in April, we put out a parody issue of the Pennsylvania News, the women's newspaper, and that was the last straw. The university uh, immediately uh, ceased publication of the Daily Pennsylvanian. Uh, we were banned from the campus for several weeks. When we came back, we were finally reinstated. The administration appointed me as editor-in-chief, not knowing that I, as features editor, had actually been responsible for the parody issue that got us banned in the first place. And the headline of the editorial when we came back on campus was, and as we were saying before we were so rudely interrupted. I was of sound physique in my youth. That's why I insisted our students try running, leaping, and other exercises. In the 1940s, we were so accomplished in football, the other Ivy League teams didn't wish to play us. I would guess the one game that stands in my mind probably more than any would be 1948, the Penn Army game. We were an underdog going into the game, and the game was seesawing back and forth, and we were ahead 20 to 19. And Army was driving down the field, and with 26 seconds to go in the game, uh, Galliffer threw a pass to a fellow named John Trent. John Trent caught the ball, and Army beat us 26-20. It was a great game. It was the kind of game you were really depressed, and you thought about it for a year or two. And then the Korean War broke out three years later, and Johnny Trent was an officer in Korea, and Johnny Trent got killed. And, you know, I changed my mind. I said, John Trent, I'm glad you caught that ball, and you beat us. I've heard that we were the first school to have players sport numerals on their uniforms and wear athletic protectors. Now that's useful as well as ornamental. And we're the only school to have participants in every Olympics since the year 1900. We made basketball's 1979 Final Four. In the 1980s, we won six Ivy League crowns in football. Women's field hockey was in the 1988 Final Four. Women's sports have come a long way since 1970. Back in 1970, we didn't have a key to the practice field. 1990, the door is open, the gate is open, and we have the opportunities to perform on Franklin Field. Every year, the world's largest and best relays carnival takes place at my field. Competing in the pin relays is probably next to my marriage is the most exciting and rewarding thing I've ever done. The relays are made up of 13,000 competitors, 40,000 fans, and held over five days last weekend in April. Uh, it's a world-renowned event, and everybody gets excited about the pin relays. And these re relays are, are unique in the world, and it's wonderful to be here as a guest. A father and his son were discussing where the son should go to college. The son said, well, father, you went to Pennsylvania. Where do you think I should go? The father said, well, son, you can go to Pennsylvania, or you can go to hell. Coming to Penn was always a family tradition. My father went, class of 31. I graduated in class of 65. Kathy will be graduating in 90, and Danny and Johnny in 1993. I think it'd be pretty hard uh... Uh, for your son not to be uh, experienced if they were singing the red and blue by the time they were five years old. Why does Penn mean so much to us? We all have different answers. I've been on probably 50 college campuses in the last 10 years, and there isn't a single campus that's as exciting, that things are happening like they are at Penn. As an alumnus of the University of Pennsylvania, I'm indeed proud to be associated with the 250th anniversary of our great institution. What makes me care about Penn is the fact that Penn cares about improving education for all the people, all the different minorities. And in fact, 
all the people throughout the world, and that's what I would like to be able to contribute to as well. It's uh, nestled in an urban setting. It's a solicitous friend to its neighbors. It basks in its diversity of students, professors, and curricula. And Penn is Penn, and for me, it's a unique institution worthy of all the support I can muster. People from all over and all walks of life come here. I wanted to come to this part of the country and spend some time, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to get a terrific education, both formally and culturally. Once I got here, I found out that there were three things I missed, though, and that was good Mexican food, barbecue, and Dr. Pepper. I used to uh, go to a local restaurant here and have them order me cases of Dr. Pepper, and it cost me more than it costs to buy a case of beer. Penn for me was um, my entrance into a bigger city and really my home, and I've been living there ever since. One of my fondest memories of Penn was the very first day I was on campus. I had just arrived and was terribly independent. My parents dropped me off, and I had chosen, because I thought it was so sophisticated, not to go to freshman camp. So there were very few girls, we called ourselves girls, in, in the dorms. And the only other person in my suite was this gorgeous blonde, very sophisticated, raised in all over the world, schooled in Switzerland, multilingual, and terribly glamorous. And I was so intimidated, I called home and I said, I don't know that I can ever fit in into this university. This other freshman is just absolutely gorgeous. And my mother said, well, what's her name? And I said, well, I don't know. Her father has something to do with puppets, and her name is Candace Bergen. This truly is a place that cares about its students. And Penn also cares about the world beyond the campus. The Say Yes to Education Foundation is a foundation to help educate the poor, domiciled at the University of Pennsylvania, the Graduate School of Education, in fact. The reason it is domiciled at the university is, is if, if for one very simple reason, the caring of Sheldon Hackney. I want to emphasize that while our primary purpose is to foster learning so as to increase our ability and the ability of our students to be of service, we should pay, pay great heed to Dr. Franklin's admonition and also work to increase the inclination of our students to use the abilities thus acquired to serve mankind, one's country, friends, and family. So you can see that the history of this university is a history of its people. And here, burning the midnight oil, is one of the people who will guide us through the future It's an honor to meet a fellow maverick, one I trust to lead my college into the next century. Tell me, Hugo, what's ahead? Well, Ben, I promise that the School of Arts and Sciences will remain at the very center of the university. We'll explore the most fundamental questions, how the universe began, how life is passed from generation to generation, how one best organizes society, will contemplate the finest expressions of our humanity. Poetry, music, art. Yes, Ben, your college will continue to craft the very best ideas, to build character, and to nurture outstanding minds. I can't wait for the next 250 years. Is there anything else? All I'd like to say is, Happy 250th Penn. Happy 250th Penn. We love you. Happy 250th Penn. Happy birthday, Penn. Happy birthday, uh, beloved University of Pennsylvania. After the first 200 years, who counts? Happy birthday, Penn. Congratulations, Penn. 250 years and no hostile takeover. Happy birthday, Pennsylvania. Happy birthday, Penn. Thank you, Ben, and happy anniversary, Pennsylvania. From New York City, happy birthday, Penn. Happy birthday, Penn. Happy birthday, Penn! Happy 250th anniversary, Penn. Happy birthday, Penn, from Texas. From City Hall to my alma mater, Penn, happy birthday. Thank you, Benjamin Franklin, for founding the school 250 years ago. Happy birthday, Penn, from the bicentennial class. The class of 1940. Happy 250th birthday, Penn. Happy 250th, Penn. 
Happy, happy birthday, birthday Penn. Penn. A happy 250th birthday to Penn. Happy birthday, Penn! Happy birthday, Penn! Happy 250th anniversary to the University of Pennsylvania. Happy birthday, Penn! Happy 250th birthday, U of P! Well, I'm delighted to wish the University of Pennsylvania a very happy 250th birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Penn. And all I want to say is, hurrah!